it actually was quite boring. Uh, interior leather bar, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe that um, uh, we've gone from the controversies uh, surrounding the making and then what actually you showed in cruising to now this boring imagination of the lost footage. I'm wondering, have you seen that film and do you have any uh, opinion about what they tried to do? <clears throat> Uh, James Franco made that film, and he, he sent it to me uh, on my iPad after he finished it. So I saw it on an iPad, and I can't really, I don't want to judge a film on an iPad. Uh, but he actually called me. I had heard that James Franco was trying to reimagine the 40 minutes or so that I had cut out of cruising. And I heard that he was making uh, his film. And I uh, thought, that's interesting. And after several weeks, he called me. I had, I've never met him. But he got my number, and he, we spoke on the phone. And he said, you know, I'm trying to do uh, a film about the missing 40 minutes of cruising. I said, yeah, I heard that. And he said, what were the missing 40 minutes? <laughs> I said, aren't you shooting this film? He said, yeah, I'm almost done. I said, why are you calling me now? He laughed and he said, well, can you tell me, can you give me a clue? I said, yes, it was 40 minutes of what you would call pornography that I shot because I was able to shoot it. The guys in the bars were friends of mine and I used to hang out in the bar. This particular bar was the mine shaft. Mine shaft. The mine shaft uh, at uh, 835 Little West 12th Street in New York. It's now a bunch of fancy restaurants. But um, it, then it was, you know, uh, the meatpacking district, and um, there were the hardcore um, S and M clubs down there. And I happened to know a lot of the guys, and I actually knew the guys who owned the clubs, who were, uh, they were in particular owned by a man named Matty the Horse Ionello. And he, he was the head of the uh, of two uh, families, the Genovese family and uh, another Italian family. And he owned the mine shaft. He, and he, he controlled almost everything on the west side of New York from top to bottom. And he was a friend of mine, and I, I liked him a lot. And um, I asked him if I could shoot in the clubs, and he said, why? And I told him I had a story about some actual murders that had taken place um, and that were written about in the Village Voice by a, a very good writer named Arthur Bell. I knew and Arthur. You knew Arthur? Yeah. And he wrote the articles. There are two things that led me to make cruising. One was Arthur Bell's articles, with more than two. The other was the fact that Matty the Horse controlled these clubs. The third thing was that there was a young man in my film, The Exorcist. And uh, do some of you know this story? So I'm telling it to you for the first time. There's a scene in the, how many have seen The Exorcist? <laughs> Cinema lovers. Uh, there's a scene in The Exorcist that most people think is the most terrifying scene in the film. It's not any of the supernatural stuff. It's the arteriogram, where in this, at the NYU Medical Center, we show the process of trying to examine the arteries of the brain by inserting the fluid into the carotid artery. The fluid goes up into the brain and it outlines the arteries of the brain to, to see those that are normal and those that aren't. And in that scene, I, I filmed it with an actual neurosurgeon and his nurse. And the nurse, um, uh, Who's, they're, they're both in the film, and the guy who was the nurse, he helped, who helps Linda Blair get on the metal table, about four years or so after The Exorcist came out, I saw this fellow's 
picture on the front page of the New York Daily News. He had been accused of uh, about eight what they called cuppy murders, C-U-P-P-I. There were body parts that had been dumped in the East River in plastic bags. And by, when they got to the, to the morgue in New York, they were thrown in drawers, that, and the drawers were labeled C-U-P-P-I, cuppy, which meant circumstances unknown pending a police investigation. And this young man, um, was accused of the Cuppy murders. And I saw his lawyer's name in the paper, and I called his lawyer, and I asked him if I might meet with him. He was being held at Rikers Island, pending being charged. And word came back that I could go and see him, which I did. I visited with him, and uh, <clears throat> I asked him if he had murdered these people. And he said, uh, well, I remember doing the one guy. He said he had picked him up at the mine shaft. The, the first victim was a man who was the theater critic for Variety in New York. His name was Addison Burrell. And he was the first uh, victim that was tossed in one of these similar plastic bags, and the way they caught this young man was that in very small print on the seam of each of the plastic bags, it said NYU Medical Center, <laughs> Neuropsychiatric Division. And so they traced the bags and charged him with the Cuppy murders. And he uh, said, I only remember doing the one I said, I was so high, I, I, don't, I can't even remember any of the others. But it was his story that he told me very freely, and he also said that he had been offered a deal by the police. If he confessed to all eight murders and a few more, they would lower his sentence. And he did. He did about uh, 25 years, maybe 30 years, and he's out. He was let out. He confessed to everything so that the police could get, you know, headlines saying all, right. all these copy murders were solved. So it was his story, uh, Arthur Bell's articles, and the fact that I had access to the clubs and knew a lot of the guys and uh, that led me to do cruising. Originally, cruising was a novel that had nothing to do with the S&M clubs. It, it was an undercover cop who goes into um, the gay world to try and entrap uh, a killer because he looked like the victims. There was, that was the premise of the novel. But I thought the novel was n not all that good, and I turned it down. And, and it was um, optioned by the producer who produced The French Connection with me. And when I turned it down, he went to another young director to do it, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Steven Spielberg was going to do cruising. <laughs> Not the way I did it. I, <laughs> there might even have been a little alien in there. I don't know. <laughs> but can you imagine, as I tried to over the years, what would have happened to Spielberg's career if he had made cruising? I mean, any, any version of it. But so uh, then um, uh, they couldn't get it set up, Spielberg and Phil D'Antoni, the producer. And a number of years later, Jerry Weintraub, uh, another producer, got the rights and came to me and he said, hey, I own the rights to cruising. And I, I said, so what? He said, well, I understand you were interested in it at one time. And I said, no, I wasn't. Uh, and then along came these three elements at about the same time, and I called Weintraub back and I said, I think I know how to do cruising now. You have a great memory. You have a great me way of telling a story, too. Well, <laughs> you know that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> My father raised <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah.